astral body. When one experiences a suprasensory outer world through the elemental body, one is less closed off from that world than one is from one's physical surroundings when one experiences them through the sensory body. At the same time, just as one bears the matter and forces of the physical outer body in one's physical body, it could be said that one's relationship to this suprasensory outer world is such that one unites with oneself certain substances of the elemental world to form an elemental body. You will notice that this is so when outside your sensory body you try to find your way about in the suprasensory world. Suppose some phenomenon of the suprasensory world, some thing or being, lies before you. It is there, you can see it, but you do not know what it is. If you are strong enough, you can drive it away. But you can do this only if you transfer yourself back into the sensory world by vigorously concentrating upon your experience there. You cannot remain within the supersensory world while comparing the phenomena you see there with others. And yet it is only through comparison that you can discover the meaning of what you have seen. Vision in the supersensory world is thus limited to simple perceptions of individual things. It cannot freely move from one thing to another. You feel yourself held fast to the particular thing. You may seek the source of that limitation, but you will find it only after further inner development has strengthened your soul. There then comes a moment, a particular instance, when the limitation is no longer there. Then you realize that the reason you cannot move freely from one thing to another lies in your own soul. You recognize that beholding the supersensory world is different from seeing in the sensible world. In the sensible world, if your eyes are working properly, you can see anything visible there. If you see one thing, you can see another. But this is not the case in the suprasensory world. You develop an organ of suprasensory observation in the elemental body in order to experience a particular suprasensory fact. But if you wish to see something else, you must first develop the organ for that. The development of such suprasensory organs of perception feels like the awakening of an organ to a specific aspect of the suprasensory world. You will feel that in relationship to the suprasensory world, the elemental body is, as it were, in a state of sleep, as if it had woken up anew to see each particular suprasensory thing. We really can speak of a sleeping and waking in the elemental world. Sleeping and waking are not, however, alternating states in the elemental world as they are in the sensory world. Both are present to us at the same time. As long as we have not achieved the capacity to experience something through the elemental body, this body is asleep. It is always with us, but it is sleeping. It begins to awaken when we strengthen our soul life. At first, however, only a part of the body awakens. Then the more we awaken our elemental nature, the deeper we live into the elemental world. The elemental world cannot help the soul in this awakening. It does not matter how much you behold. Nothing you behold offers you any help in seeing anything else. In fact, there is nothing in the elemental environment that can help the soul achieve free movement in the suprasensory. Nevertheless, if you continue the exercises to strengthen your soul, you will increasingly achieve this mobility in certain areas. By means of this, you will become aware of something in yourself that does not belong to the elemental world, but which you discover in yourself through experiencing it, namely, you realize you are a distinct being in the suprasensory world, a kind of guide or master for your elemental body who gradually awakens that body to suprasensory consciousness. 
When you arrive at that point, a frightful feeling of loneliness overcomes the soul. You see yourself in a world that is elemental on all sides, and within those endless elemental expanses you see yourself as the only being that cannot find another like it anywhere. It cannot be stated categorically that every path of development toward clairvoyance will lead to this terrible loneliness. But those whose path it is to consciously strengthen their souls through their own power will come to that point. Those, too, who follow a teacher who gives step-by-step directions so that they may advance in their development will certainly realize one day, it may come sooner or later, that the teacher has left them to themselves. They will find that their teacher has abandoned them to loneliness in the elemental world. Later, however, they will recognize that the teacher dealt wisely with them and had to turn them over to themselves when the necessity for such independence arose. At this stage in the soul journey, soul's journey, you will see yourself as an exile, abandoned in the elemental world. You can move forward, however, if through inner exercises you have achieved sufficient soul strength. You will then begin to see a new world emerge, not in the elemental world, but in yourself. This world is different, both from the sensory world and the elemental world. Thus, to the first supersensory world, the elemental or etheric world, we add a second. At first, this second supersensory world is wholly an inner world. You will feel that you carry it within yourself and that you are d- alone with it. To compare this state with something in the sensory world, consider the following. Suppose all our relatives died and we carried in our souls only our memories of our loved ones. For us, our beloved would live on only as thoughts. That is how it is in the second supersensory world. You know that you carry it within you, but at the same time you know that you are shut out of its reality. But the reality of this second supersensory world that lives in the soul is quite different from the reality we experience as mere memory images in the sensory world. This new suprasensory world lives its own independent existence in our soul, in your soul. Everything in that world wants to leave the soul and wants to move toward something else. You feel a world within the soul, but one that does not wish to stay there. This makes you feel as if each particular thing in that world were tearing you apart. You might even have the experience of these particulars setting themselves free, as it were, ripping through something like the outer garments of your soul, fleeing it. You will feel the poorer for all that was torn in this way from your soul. At this point you learn that anything suprasensory in your soul, that you love for its own sake, and not simply because it lives in your soul, behaves in a specific way. What you love for its own sake, for what it is, will not flee your soul. It will, of course, push out of the soul, but it will take your soul with it, so to speak. This suprasensory content will lead the soul to where the suprasensory lives in its own reality. Whereas previously you carried only a kind of copy of that suprasensory essence within you, now a kind of union with the true nature of the real essence takes place. The love I refer to here must be the kind that can be experienced in the suprasensory world. In the sensory world you can only prepare yourself for this kind of love. You do so by strengthening your capacity to love in this world. The stronger the love you are capable of in the sensory world, the more that capacity remains with you in the suprasensory world. The connection between this capacity and the particulars of the suprasensory world is such that you can, for instance, 
reach the true suprasensory beings that are in connection with the plants in the sensory world only when you love the plants in the sensory world. Here an error can easily arise. A person may pass by plants in the sensory world quite without love, and yet that person's soul may conceal an unconscious inclination toward the plant world. In that case, this love can awaken when he or she enters the supersensory world. Union with beings in the supersensory world can depend upon soul characteristics other than love, such as respect or awe. In the supersensory world, a soul can feel respect or awe for a being as soon as the reflection of that being arises within it. <clears throat> we must always include respect and awe among the inner soul qualities. Such soul qualities open the door so that you can come to know beings of the supersensory world. A sure way of coming to know the supersensory world opens when we free up the access to supersensory beings by relating to their reflections within us. In the sensory world, you love a being after you have come to know it. In the second supersensory world, you learn to love a being's image before encountering that being's reality, because the image appears before the meeting with the being. What the soul comes to know in this way is not the elemental body, but rather the awakener, of the elemental body. A being exists within your soul that you experience as you would experience yourself if during sleep you were not unconscious but felt your self-conscious outside your physical body and upon awakening felt yourself to be the awakener. Thus the soul learns of the presence of a third nature within it that is apart from the physical and elemental bodies we call this third nature the astral body, meaning by this, for the moment, nothing more than what lives within the soul's being as we have described above.